So I text them and let them know I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I already started broadcasting. Make sure they can hear. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Can you hear? Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. Anything else? إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل لنا وما يضل فلا هادي لنا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد I want to take the opportunity of this gathering the sisters have put together to help raise funds for the renovation of the new home of Mashad al-Rahmah, the new Mashad that Allah wa Ta'ala blessed us with and bestowed us with, to remind ourselves of a number of affairs as regards the importance of spending for the sake of Allah wa Ta'ala as it relates to the woman and as it regards the and as regards the example of the woman of the past and how they spend for the sake of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and nafaqat al wajiba wa ma duna dhalik any the mandatory spending and what is less than that of spending and as much as that the nafaqat upon the woman the also of an nafaqat is that an nafaqat is for the rijal the fundamental rules regards sp- uh, expenses and expenditures as regards the woman is that they are free of mandatory expenses. Any al-rijal qawwamun ala nisa. As Allah wa ta'ala, He made the men the guardians and keepers of the woman. Bima faddal Allahu ba'dahum ala ba'd. But be virtue that Allah wa ta'ala gave to some over others. And due to what they spend of their wealth. 
And so the Muslim woman does not have the same responsibilities as regards spending that the man has. And the responsibility is not hers as it is in the case of the man as regards spending. However, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu highly encouraged the woman to spend. And he mentioned the very vivid reason that would compel the woman to spend. When he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, O woman, tasaddaqna, give in charity, waktharna min al-istighfar, waktharna min al-istighfar, and, and make a lot of istighfar, fa'inni ra'aytu kunna akthara ahli nar and excel in seeking forgiveness from Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, for verily I saw you as a majority of the people of the fire. I saw that the women are the majority of people in the fire. Na'udhu billahi min al nar And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in the well-known hadith of the story of Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i, when he came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Wasallam called him to Islam and he narrated the events of that day and what he saw within the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and outside of the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the interaction of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the Muslims and his attending to calling to Allah wa Ta'ala ordering the good, forbidding the evil inviting the disbelievers to Islam and attending to the needs of the poor and unfortunate, particularly the poor woman in his community. In that narration, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the things that Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i heard from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam radiyallahu anna an Adi May Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam be pleased with Adi ibn Hatim who became Muslim that day is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَهَدٍ إِلَّا سَيُكَلِّمُهُ رَبُّهُ there is not a single one of you except that his Lord will speak to him لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ تُرْجُمَانِ without an interpreter between him and Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala فَيَنْظُرُ الْأَيْمَنَ مِنْ فَلَا يَرَى إِلَّا مَا قَدَّمْ and he will look to his right side and not see anything except for what he put forward of good. And he will look to his left side. فَلَا يَرَى إِلَّا مَا قَدَّمْ And he will not see anything except for what his hands put forward of evil. And he will look directly in front of him. وَلَا يَرَى إِلَّا النَّارَ تِلْقَاءَ وَجْهِهِ And he will see nothing except for the fire right in front of his face. فَاتَّقُوا النَّارُ وَلَوْ بِشِقِي تَمْرَى فَإِنْ لَمْ تَجِدْ فَبِكَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ And you save yourself from the fire even if by giving a piece of a date. And if you do not have the ability to do so, فَبِكَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ And you then do so by speaking a good word. We know that the affair of establishing a masjid, the affair of establishing a masjid without a doubt is something that demonstrates a person's love of the hereafter and a person's disinterest in the, in the dunya and striving for what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the entire purpose of the masjid is to bring about within the person a taqwa as comes in the statement of Salman he said to his brother Abu Dhar Ya akhi alzam al-masjid fa inna al-masjid bayta kulli taqiyya inni sami'tu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul al-masjid bayta kulli taqiyya O oh, my brother, sit close to the masjid, for verily I heard the Prophet wasallam say that the masjid is the home of every person with taqwa. The masjid is the home of every person with taqwa. The masjid has a tremendous status in Islam as we know, and it is mandatory to establish the houses of Allah wa ta'ala. As the Messenger of Allah wasallam said in the hadith of Aisha collected by Imam Al-Hafidh Abi Dawood al-Sijistani rahimahullah ta'ala, the great scholar of hadith and his sunan, that from the hadith of Aisha, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Amarana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an ibn al-masajid fi al-duar wa antu tayyib wa tunadhaf 
the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered us to build the masajid in the residential in the residential neighborhoods where the Muslims uh, reside and to clean the masajid and fragrate the masjid, make sure they have a good fragrance, a good aroma. And therefore, since it is mandatory to establish the houses of Allah, ta'ala, whatever it takes to complete a wajib, to complete an obligation, then it is mandatory. Then that affair is mandatory. A Shaykh ibn Ubaz, rahimahullah ta'ala, he gave a tremendous advice that is collected in his collection of uh, Rasail and Fatawa, in his collection of maqalat, and he, of articles and essays and fatawa, that is a very voluminous work. A Shaykh ibn Ubaz, rahimahullah ta'ala, he wrote a tremendous advice that is called Al-Aqaliyyatul Muslima, Dhurufuha wa Amanuha. And he, the Muslim minorities, meaning the Muslim communities that are minority communities amongst the disbelieving majority, that uh, Muslims who reside in the lands of disbelief. And he, al-aqaliyatul muslima, dhurufuha, and he, their circumstances and situations and conditions and their amal, and, he, and their ambitions, expectations, and hopes. And he wrote in this advice, that it is mandatory to support the Muslims. It is mandatory to support the Muslims and the in minority communities in the West. Ala qadrin kan bi musa'adatin ma'adiyya wa musa'adatin ma'nawiyya. And according to the best of one's ability, and this is the meaning of his speech, I don't have it in front of me. According to the best of his ability, in uh, with with a uh, with a uh, it is mandatory to support the Muslims in the lands of disbelief in the establishment of masajid, the building of schools, and wanahwaha, and affairs that are of this sort, with material support and moral support. And it is mandatory upon the Muslims as a whole to help them according to the best of their ability. Based upon the principle that what it takes to complete an obligation is an obligation. And so we have with us, or in front of us in these days, a tremendous opportunity to spend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to establish a legacy for the future generations to establish that which inshallah Tabarak wa ta'ala will be they it will be the Qusba and it will be the pinnacle of our city, the pinnacle of Newark, New Jersey, the pinnacle of the Dawat al Salafiya, a beacon of light in the area. It will be, inshallah, Tabarak wa ta'ala, the center of a community, and we hope and we know that currently, alhamdulillah, many of our brothers and many of the families are looking at the developments that are being built around the new masjid from the apartment buildings and town houses and so on and so forth and are interested in populating the area. And this is what we hope will happen. And on top of the people spending to establish the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that those that have the ability to do so, that and those that it is practical for them to do so, that they will populate the area. That they will populate the area and they will turn the neighborhood into a Muslim neighborhood. And that when uh, uh, housing becomes available in that area, and you see there are many duplexes and so on and so forth in that area, uh, large duplexes, family, any two family homes, and so on and so forth. That the that the revelation in much of the Middle East, because the much of the uh, mercantile uh, mercantile trade of the Ottoman Empire had been in tobacco. They had been the place where your husbands will learn how to be better husbands, a place where your children will learn how to grow up and be more mature and prioritize what is most important, the likes of these things. I and mean, if we do not spend the path of Allah wa ta'ala, then what is likely to occur is protect us from the iman being snatched out of our chest, from guidance being snatched away from us. And he let ta'man al balaz Abu Darda he said, never feel safe from being tested. For wallahi in a rajula yuftana fi sa'atin wahida fayan qalibu and dinihi is reported by Al Fariyabi Rahimullah Ta'ala in his book Sifatun Nifaq, yani the quality of the hypocrites that Abu Darda authentically 
Abu Darda, he said, never feel safe from being tested by Allah. A person can be put to test at any moment with a test that could cause him to ab abandon apostate from his religion. Na'udhu billahi. And we seek the refuge of Allah wa ta'ala from the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naza'aha minhum. And if the people do not use the blessings of Allah wa ta'ala, the blessing of guidance, the blessing of wealth, the blessing of children, the blessing of all the things that Allah wa ta'ala has given us, naza'aha minhum. Allah may snatch those blessings away from them. فَحَوَّلَهَا إِلَىٰ خَيْرِهِمْ And transfer those blessings to others. And transfer those blessings to others. So the affair is jiddan muhim. It's extremely, extremely, extremely urgent, extremely important. I need to protect ourselves from the punishment of Allah. I need from destruction in this world and the punishment of Allah in the hereafter. Prophet some likewise along the lines of what we heard in the, in the ayah, وَأَنْفِقُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِنَا تَحْلُكَ Spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not cast yourself into destruction at your own hand. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالشُّوحُ فَإِنَّ الشُّوحَ قَدْ أَهْلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ أَمَرَهُمْ أَنْ يَقْتَعُوا أَرْحَامَهُمْ وَيَسْفِكُوا دِمَاءَهُمْ I warn you against greediness and stinginess. For verily stinginess destroy the previous nations, the previous communities. I warn you from stinginess, for verily stinginess destroy the previous communities. أَمَرَهُمْ أَنْ يَقْتَعُوا أَرْحَامَهُمْ وَيَسْفِكُوا دِمَاءَهُمْ their stinginess ordered them, it compelled them to severing the ties of the womb, to destroying their family, their familial ties, the, the ties between them on a family level. And to shed the blood of one another. And to shed the blood of one another. And when the wealth was opened up, as we heard in the khutbah yesterday, when the wealth was opened up for the Muslims in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu and the king of Persia, was brought in chains, Harun Muzan was brought in chains and it ended up accepting Islam uh, later on. And the prince of Persia, Harun Muzan, was brought in chains along with any much of the wealth of Persia, so on and so forth, in front of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in the masjid of the Prophet wasallam. And the wealth was brought in and Umar cried and he said, this wealth was never opened up to anyone except that they went astray, except that they were destroyed. Umar radiallahu anhu, he took that wealth and he expanded the grounds of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he built the entire society around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the city of Medina was expanded and it was fortified and its walls were built and, re and refortified and new walls were built and so on and so forth in a complete circle and, he, and the pinnacle, the middle, the center of the city was made the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the mashad of the Prophet And with the, as an interesting point, with the current day expansion, the expansion that occurred in the 80s, and there's new expansion going on now for the mashad of the Prophet I mean, what was the city of Medina during the time of the Prophet wasallam, is today the mashad of Nabawi. The whole, the, I mean, the whole city is where the mashad is at now. The whole city is where the mashad is at now. Umar radiallahu anhu, likewise, we heard when he built Kufa, when Umar built Kufa, he told the governor to go out and to take an archer, to take a skilled archer and to shoot an arrow in all four directions, north, south, east, and west. And that will be the grounds of the masjid, to go to the place that was best for them to build the city and to shoot the arrow in each direction and to make that the parameter of the masjid, the parameter of the masjid, the border and the boundaries of the masjid. And he allowed them to build buildings to the north, to the south, to the east and the west, in a complete circle around the city, or around the masjid, that was going to be the center of the city. The place that brought all the people together. And the place that was the most important structure in the society. And Kufa, and it became the capital of Islam during the time of Ali, when Ali was a Khalifa, it became the capital of Islam. Kufa was the capital of the uh, Dar al Imara, and the rulership transferred to Kufa. Later on, when the city of Baghdad was built during the time of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, and he was from the first, if not the first, uh, was from the first, he was from the first Abbasid Khulafa, from Banu al-Abbas, at the end of the time of the Tabi'een. If you were to look, historically you could find the documents, I mean the drawings are still available today, and he, of the structure of the, the plans for the city of Baghdad. 
the city of Baghdad. Baghdad didn't used to exist. It never existed before. There was nothing there. And so they built Baghdad upon the banks of, upon the banks of the uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and uh, they built it in a perfect circle. And the core of the city, the center of the city, was the main masjid, the main masjid. I mean, this is what we find all throughout the history of Islam. I mean, this is the the historians of Islam, and the and the uh, geographers of Islam, the historians of Islam, like Al Baladori, and Al Tabari, and others, and Ibn Kathir. I mean, they documented these things meticulously. The description of the cities of the Muslims and the societies of the Muslims, and he, and the geographers of Islam that went through those cities. And he, through the early generations of Islam, all the way up into the time of the Mongol invasions, before many of those cities were destroyed as a punishment from Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, because the Ummah had fallen to heresy and innovation and abandoned the Sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the likes of these affairs. And he, when they described the cities, they described these huge, enormous walled cities in this civilization that the world had never seen anything like. When they described these cities, the first place that they described was the house of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala the most important building and what was usually the center of each city, especially the cities that they built from the ground up, was always a masjid. It was always a masjid. And so if we're going to establish something, this has to be the core of what we establish. If we're going to have something that's going to last for generations, this is where it has to begin. By building this strong foundation, contributing to build the house of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala. And we leave with the story that occurred any about... Uh, 100 years of the time of Imam Ahmad rahimullah ta'ala and the 4th century Hijri and we heard this story and perhaps some of you saw the tweet that we put out on Twitter uh, the story of the uh, the ruler whose name was Hassan ibn Sa'id al-Mani'i Hassan ibn Sa'id al-Mani'i and he was a merchant and he was a ruler and he took his wealth and he used his status to build many masajid he took his wealth and he used his status to build many masajid, some of the largest masajid, yani the Jami of Nisabur, yani the Jami of, uh, uh, and he mentions any yani, of Dhahabi and Sama'ani and others, they mention some of the masajid, the cities that he built in Khurasan, in Khurasan, which is modern day Iran. Uh, this great imam, a scholar, he's a student of knowledge, he was a, yani he was a, he was a learned person, he wasn't necessarily a scholar. He was an imam as far as being a ruler and a person who supported the sunnah and so on and so forth. And we heard this story when the woman, who was a poor woman, the woman, and, 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 and bear in mind that he was the ruler and he was in charge of the treasury of the Muslims and the Muslims were extremely wealthy. The Salajika and the Seljuks, uh, the Seljuks, the Salajika, and he had de defeated Banu Buway, had defeated the Rafida. And he who had oppressed and slaughtered the scholars of the Sunnah and the people of the Sunnah and so on and so forth. And they supported the religion of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, Nasran Mu'azzaran. And with a tremendous support as a blessing from Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, they were extremely wealthy. They were extremely, extremely, extremely wealthy and there was much money in the Muslim treasury. And so they didn't need to ask the community to contribute. They didn't need to ask the community to give for the sake of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. But the people in the community, the poorest of the people in the community, when they had these sorts of projects, the building of massages, so on and so forth, they wanted to play whatever role that they could play in the building of the houses of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. So we heard the story, she had a thawba garment that she wanted to sell so she could have some money to give as a donation for the building of the masjid. And the garment was worth a half of a dinar, meaning it was probably slightly used. It was I mean, in, in bad shape. It wasn't something that was an expensive garment in the mercantile trade, I mean, the textile trade. Much of I mean, the society and the economy of the Muslims was built, up, built upon the textile industry and so on and so forth. And so I any mean, garments could go for you know hundreds of dinars, hundreds of dirham, these sort of things. I any mean, person would have any any thiyaf fakhira, any very expensive, wealthy any mean, clothing and so on and so forth, made of the best materials and the likes of these things. She had a, a, a thawb that was worth a half of a dinar. It was worth a half of a dinar, and it was probably worth I any mean, something, I any mean, equivalent of maybe ten, fifteen dollars today. It was worth barely anything. It was worth half of a silver piece. And this this uh, this ruler, he bought the thawb for a thousand dinars. He bought the thawb for a thousand dinars, and she took the money and she gave it to the chazan to the head of the Muslim treasury to build the house of Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's a tremendous lesson that is learned. It's a tremendous lesson that is learned in this story, and which is that even in a situation where the rulers and the people of authority, they have plenty of wealth, and they do not need to ask the people in the community to donate and to give for the sake of Allah wa ta'ala, to establish these masajid, the people, the poorest of the people in the society, whenever these sorts of projects would come up, they would try to spend what they could to play some role in the khair. This was the understanding that they had in those generations. And there are many, many stories about the generosity of the women of the early generations. And, you know, we've any, presented enough and are encouraging the sisters to give. And this is a fundraiser. You give what you can for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have gold, if you have silver, if you have jewelry, if you have whatever you have to give, give it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have some vision and have some hope for the future. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a thabat and to... Bless this endeavor and to bless everyone who was involved in this endeavor. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.